Hello, this is Sophie Lawson from sophielawson.com and this is episode 170 of the Sophie Art Podcast, which is a little podcast that I do about the art and things with me co-host Little Dennis. And Little Dennis is really excited today because today we are looking at an article, an ickle article from the Imagine FX magazine. This is issue number 201 and it's an article called... 15 tips for better character design with the artist David Melling. Now this one is massive. It's a really big article and it's jam-packed with goodness. We've even got a new little drawing exercise which I, I'm going to go through on the podcast as well. So I, I think you can enjoy this one. And let's get straight into it. Little Kitty and Little Dennis are here. <laughs> oh, we, didn't have any, we haven't had any kitty kisses for ages. I think Little Dennis has missed those. But little Kitty, she's definitely feeling a lot more refreshed now, which is nice. <laughs> and little Dennis is as well. And you can see little Dennis... Well, what I'm going to do is, when I get into this article, I'm going to go through the actual article. And if you're watching on YouTube, at youtube.com slash Sophie Lawson, you'll be able to see little images and stuff. But as I always say, you don't really need to see the images. I'll, I'm going to just do my best to explain it all. I hope you enjoy this. Let's get straight into it. Doing oh, there's a little one, little Dennis and a little little dong today. We're going to put them in there. Actually, little Dennis is going to sit with us. So little Dennis is with us for this one, and we're going into the issue two hundred and one of the Imagine FX magazine, which I've actually done a click look at this. It should be on my YouTube, or it should be on my YouTube now when this one goes up. But we're looking at an article called Fifteen Tips for Better Character Design with the artist David Melling. So what I do on these is, I go through the article, just having a look at the images and talking about the things, but really I'm sort of going through my notes. So yesterday I went through this article, article, and took out my little notes, and what I do is I'll start with my main takeaways, so we, we know, actually I'll start with the intro, and then I'll talk a little bit about David Melling, the artist, and then I'll go through my main takeaways, and then I'll go through each section talking about the things I learnt and stuff. So the artist, David Melling, this is what they say about him. They said, he's an author, illustrator, and David has published around 150 books in over 30 languages, including the Huglas Douglas series. (laughs) How cool is that? Huglas Douglas. So I went onto his little website, which is davidmelling.co.uk, and I'll put links and everything in the description. And what I noticed was, He's into children's books. So that's what he's doing. And I love... Well, I'm getting r- right into this. He's basically created a load of children's books. But he's, his art is very playful. That's the thing. Very playful. And I always say... Like... Oh, he's got a, he's got a character here called Harry the Dog. Which I love this one. This looks like a little reoccurring character. So the thing is, he's cool. As soon as I saw him on there, I thought, oh, I like him. So that's good because, as I always say, if you're studying from people who are doing things that you love, I feel like that's actually going to give you more excitement to learn. So that that, that was that. So what is this article about? Well, this article, it says, I was once, this is what he says, I was once asked to name three important skills required to be a successful book illustrator. And he says, I said in no particular order, draftsmanship, character and pathos now i didn't know what that word pathos meant so i had to actually look it up online and the word pathos is a quality that evokes pity or sadness and then they put the character injects his customary humor and and pathos into the role so i feel like that pathos is actually it's like for me that pathos means like triggering an emotion some sort of connection and he talks about that in this thing but the thing at the top, it says, illustrator and author David Melling reveals how he brings his book characters to life using exaggeration, silent narrative, props and more. So that's what we're getting into. We've got 15 little tips and the tips very quickly are character sheets. It takes time to design a character that feels right. Number three is draw living, breathing animals. Number four is sequential drawing. Number five is a blend of animal and fantasy. Number six, exaggeration. And he's put in in brackets when sometimes less is more. 
Number seven, emotion through symmetry. Number eight, expressive silhouettes. Number nine is colouring Huglas Douglas. <laughs> I loved that. That was something I I just I recently did a click look at the book How to Be a Car- Children's Book Illustrator by 3D Toto Publishing. And something I noticed in there was a lot of the thing about children's books is not just the writing, it's not just the um the images, and it's not just the writing, it's the way that it's the language, the playfulness of the words, like Huglas Douglas. That just sounds cool. So I like that, but this number nine is broken into three bits about capturing the posing pencil, wet and wet watercolours, and embracing happy little accidents. Number ten, little tip number ten is building up anticipation. Number eleven, body language. Number twelve is silent narratives. Number thirteen is playful sketchbook, and I feel like the word playful is right through this, through this article. So I feel like this artist is actually quite a playful character himself. And then number 14, we've got background characters. And the final one is 10 for the price of one. <laughs> How cool is that? You buy you buy one, you get 10. That's what they say, isn't it? But the, the little... So we've got all the tips there. My main takeaways were drawing exercise. So we're actually going to go through a new little drawing exercise here, which I've never heard of before. But I had a lot of fun with this. And it's a... Well, we'll get to that in a minute. So I love that. The fact that we actually learned a new drawing exercise. I put the word playful, keywords, open-minded, silhouettes, subtle, exaggeration, happy accidents, lots of an- anrom- anromorphic, where you're turning animals into humans, and anthro- anthropomorphic. <laughs> and then what? our oh, connection. Yeah, nothing's ever wasted, gesture and relationships. So that's it. And I've, I've said there's so much wisdom in this book, in this article, but it's, it's very simple, which I like that. So if we get into this and start with the first one, the first one is called Character Sheets. So what did I put here? Well, I've, in my little notes, I've actually said, why have I put this here? Oh, so in the intro, I've not finished the intro yet. In the intro, he was saying, consume what you love, but study why you love it i love that they were talking about that on svs learn recently on the podcast three point perspective they said what you want to do is as you're let's say you're watching a film or something you want to watch it but at the same time sort of ask yourself if you if you're watching a a cartoon or a film or something and there's a character and you think i love that character instead of just leaving it there it's like you want to start asking yourself why do i love that character trying to work it out and what they say is if you keep doing that with all these characters you love you start to notice these things that are connecting them all and then what will happen is you you that's you that's going to come into your artwork and i've already noticed that with me with me little characters so i love that and he's putting it he's putting it he's always asking questions as well that's going to come into something later is he's asking questions as he's creating a character but i thought to myself this morning as i was walking home from work the artist is asking questions as he's creating a character. But what happens is, if you do this successful character, what's going to happen is the person looking at the the character is going to be asking them questions themselves. So the artist, well, David Melling, he, he said, as he's drawing his little characters, he says, he, he's asking, que- oh, this is a different bit. But he, he's, he asks, what is a character? How do you find it? How do you use it? So these are the sort of questions he's asking and as we're going into this article but later on he's asking questions like as he's creating a character he's asking what's he like what's the character like so he, he wants to get a picture in his head of as he's drawing i love that but then what the thing i noticed was as i if i'm the viewer looking at his artwork he, i'm going to be looking at it thinking oh, what, what's that character doing let's say there's a little doggy you're sort of thinking he's got a bone or something you're thinking where did he get that bone from so I love this. That it's like lots of questions, and that questions is curiosity, and that curiosity is what gets you excited and makes you turn the pages. So he's put here no golden ticket, but there's ways to maximise your chance of success. So I've put this goes into something I've learned in the other articles. You're sort of playing and making things up, but you're always mindful of the rules, and he's doing the same thing here as well. 
And then he says, the main thing he wants out of creating characters is to resonate with others. And I've put here connection. He, your connect, your character connects with the viewer and, you, you, and you're connected to the character. So again, how cool is this? It's almost like the viewer is indirectly being connected to you as the artist. And your little character in the middle is like connecting both of you. <laughs> I thought it was quite cool. But the first one is character sheets. So what I did as I was studying this, I've not done this before. I thought, it was, I, thought it was, I enjoyed doing this. What I did was before I read anything that he had put in his little, in the article, I asked myself, what do I think character sheets is? So I said, what do I think it is? And I've put turning keywords into images and I've put in brackets story and then I've put feelings and understanding the character's life. So understanding the backstory of the character. So as I went into the article, this is the little notes I took out of it. I put design first. So he's using words like toddler and playful. So in the little article, he's he's got what he's got is he's got this little dog character. And the dog is there's how many is there? Two, four, six, eight, ten. There's twelve little quite simple little sketches really of a little dog character playing. Just having fun, living his life, which is cool. But as he's talking about this character, which he's named Rufus, <laughs> Ruffles, he's named him Ruffles. He's, he's, he's using words like, well, he said he's a puppy, but also a toddler. And I'm trying to get that across here in his playfulness. So I always, well, and he's he put it here, look, he's put anamorphic, anthropomorphic. So what he's doing is he's turning the dog into like a, a, a child, a baby, so that the the child who's reading and is actually going to start feeling connected to the dog. But he's also said he doesn't want to push that too far. He still wants to keep it as a dog. He doesn't want to turn it into an actual human. So he says about the dog is always standing on four legs. So he, the dog is still a dog, but it's it's looking like a human. He's mixing the two together. I like that. So in my notes, I've put he's turned a dog into a human. So that gives you connection with the the viewer, but he's keeping him a dog. So again, he's got to be mindful of that. He's got to be mindful that he doesn't push the dog too much into a a human. And he said, I put it. He's asking questions as he's drawing. So he's asking, what's he like? Is he shy, bold, <laughs> bold, 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 bold? As in, is he like courageous? Is he moody? And does he walk? What's that? Yeah, does he walk? Does he walk? That's a weird question. How uh, how does he walk? And then he, what he does is he's bringing his character to life in his head. So he's like, he sort of, he sort of, what I feel like he's doing is he's, he's creating this character in his head by asking questions. And then he's just letting his hand bring that, what he's seeing in his head in, into life. Which I, I love that. So there was a thing here. It was a um, Draftsman podcast with Stan Prokopenko and Marshall Vandruff. One of the recent ones, it was issue, it was season three, episode eight. It was all about concept art. There was this artist on there called Kirsten something. <laughs> and what she said was, oh, she's, this was beautiful. When I heard this, I thought, oh, I'm having that. What she said was, she said, there's this dance between depiction and description when you're creating characters. Now, what he's done here is, form, what she was talking about there was, she was talking about how as you're like creating as you're sketching out a character you're creating the forms but then as you're creating those forms you've got to start thinking how do these forms function so let's say you've got you created a character with like a wooden leg you've now got to think about the function of that because it's actually got to make you've got to make sure it works but then so she starts talking about how you you might change the the look of that wooden leg so it's got more function but by changing the function of it you actually start creating a new form. <laughs> so what what she was talking about was there's this constant back and forth between form and function. Well, he's talking about that here. It, these character sheets, he was talking about how you got this pose. So these different poses are creating a story. But the, the character... So what did I put? I put the pose creates the character, but the character is creating the pose. So again, it's this back and forth going on. So in his head, he's, he's creating the character... He's then drawing that into a pose, and by drawing the pose, it's going back into his head to create more of a character, and then he's going to draw another pose. So it's almost like what these character sheets is like. He's he's sort of getting out on the paper the the sort of 
the essence of the character, really. But he said he does this. He, look, he says he started out by saying, "Once I'm happy with a particular design, I create character sh- the sheets, the character sheets." So he's already got the design of the character in his head. These character sheets is just a way of working out what this character is really like. But the other thing I've noticed is this goes into what this Kirsten said. She says the form is creating a function and function the form. So even though he's happy with the design, as he starts sort of creating these character sheets, it might be that the design starts changing. So I thought that was cool. I really loved that. And the other thing is, it just looks cool. You end up with a sheet of this, a sheet of poses of this character. It's just fun. So the, the next, what did I put? Yeah, beautiful feeling, character and poses. So the next, the next little tip we've got is number two, and it's called "It takes time to design a character that feels right." So before I even looked at any of the notes, I asked myself, "What do I think this is?" So what do I think this is all about? And I've put thumbnails. Don't rush into the details, which reminded me of the big bastard basic shapes. And I've put the word experiment. So th- that's what I think. I think this is all about not rushing into the details so as i went into the little article this is me little notes that i got i've put there's a relationship between the drawing and the artist and i've put it's like giving birth to a baby <laughs> but in this case the baby is an actual character so this is what he says in the article he says designing a character is never simple and rarely and rarely happens quickly the more i draw the more the design he's put proportion shape and so on settles on the page and then what he's got is he's got these two versions of his of a character called Huglas Douglas. He's got the first version of him, which was like the first design, and then he's got another version of him when he's actually on the, the book cover. And he's talking about how, well, he says he said these two versions of Huglas Douglas show how much he changed from early concept to final design. The thing he talks about is he he didn't even realise that the character was really changing until he put them together. It goes back to what I said about here. As you're creating a character, the character itself is actually going to change the design of the character. So I love this. When I did some abstract painting, I started to realise, the first time I did abstract painting, I started to realise that you and the paint are actually working together. It's not that you're completely in control. Well, it's the same thing with these characters. You're not actually completely in control of these characters. I'm convinced that the character themselves are actually alive and they're almost using you to bring themselves to life which is quite i love that he's talking about keywords again like he uses the word jolly so i like that throughout this article is there's these keywords sprinkled about the characters he's drawing so that just makes me feel like what he's done is he's already had these keywords before he drew the character and he sort of he's kept those keywords in his head so now when he looks at this character he sees the word jolly because that's that's what he'd sort of he's trained himself to think. He talks about how the mouth is hidden on this character. So this little this little Huglas Douglas hasn't got a mouth. And I thought to myself, that's a bit like my character with the little Sophie. She's got no eyes at the moment. So what you have to do is, because you've got no facial features, you have to sort of you have to sort of bring the the character and the expressions in other areas, like the actual well, something he talks about in a minute is body language. So I like that. It's almost like just because you haven't got a mouth doesn't mean you you can't sort of express things. I like that. he's put he's put here. He's he said he's it's subtle. He talks about how it's subtle. I need a hug. He's created a pose where the little bear, Huglas Douglas, you get this vibe that he needs a hug. <laughs> it's quite cool. And he's done that without the little mouth there. And I, well, the thing I thought is you've got these two characters. You've got the first one and you've got the final one. I actually prefer the first one. The first one is much more fat and cuddly. And the first one is overpowering. It's like a snowball. Whereas the other one, the snowball's a bit smaller. So for me, I actually preferred the first one, which was cool. That was just something I noticed there. The third, the third little art tip is called Draw Living, Breathing Animals. So what did I think about this before I got into it? Well, the first thing is, what we've got is, we've got a tiger. A blue and white tiger. Firstly, I love the colours of it. Really cool. But it's got this oriental vibe about it, which I think is brilliant. 
So this is what I thought when I read the little tip. What do I think Draw Living Breathing Animals is all about? And I've put studying life, I've put using reference, and I've put, what is it? Act out the pose, so become the animal. <laughs> that's what I think, This is what, that's what I thought it was going to be all about. And this is what it was actually about. He says, I was once asked to draw a hungry cat sitting on a mat in front of a bowl of delicious food. Part of the brief included words like ravenous, excited and anticipation. Well, I drew the cat almost symmetrically, including its ears and paws. The result was stiff and interesting. In silhouette, it didn't read as a cat. So what he's, what he's doing here is he, he didn't think about, he didn't, well, I feel like he didn't study the cats enough. <laughs> but he's put here keywords again, silhouettes again. And it's like little details like the, the tail curling. So the t- And I thought to myself, this cat that he's drawn, the tail is is like curling up. It f- makes it feel like it's alive. Firstly, we've got an amazing little shape going on with the tail. So already, already he's got these, these cool, this cool sort of line of flow of... It's a beautiful line going right through the character because of, the, because of this tail. But the thing is, that is actually making it more like a cat. But it also makes the tail feel alive. And I thought to myself, this is like... A lot of the characters I love are characters with big hair. And I always think to myself, it's almost like the hair itself is a character. Well, I feel like that. that's here with this tail. This goes into something... I just thought something. This cat used to jump in my me, in me window, in where I, the place I used to live. I'd sometimes sit and watch this cat asleep. And sometimes the, t- the tail was moving. And I would, I would say... I called the cat funny. And I'd say, funny. I'd whisper, funny. Every time I did that, this little tail moved. And I, I, I was convinced. I became convinced that the tail was had a mind of its own. And I, I sort of thought to myself, does the cat know that it's, the tail's moving or is the tail sort of moving on its own? I'd love to know, I'd love to know that because I'm convinced that these tails on these cats and stuff is actually sort of, they've got some sort of mind or something. <laughs> it's quite weird. But, but this one here, so, so he says, whenever I draw a character, I think of them as living, breathing creatures. A tail is curling, thoughtful. The tiger is standing still, but he's definitely alive. So I like that. So I feel like it is about studying the creature you're you're drawing, so you know it so much that it is it is actually true to life. The next little tip we got is called sequential drawing. Now, when I saw this, this is what I've put in my notes. I asked myself, "What do I think sequential drawing is?" I said, "No idea. I had no idea what it was." I said, "Maybe testing out poses, angles, or story?" Question marks. Turns out. As I started reading, it's a drawing exercise, and he says it was created by the artist Morris Sendek, and it's he called this art the the artist Morris called it fantasy sketches, but what he's done is this artist David Melling has actually turned it into his own little drawing exercise, and what he does is he, this is what he says, well what you do is you get a piece of A4 paper, you don't it doesn't have to be A4, but he he uses A4. And working from top left to bottom right, you set a 10 minute timer. And that 10 minute timer means you're not focusing on details. You see, and then he, what he does is he creates a random character right from the off. Random character. Because I was thinking to myself, I'm going to have a go at this. But I was already thinking, I'm going to do this with Peter the Penguin. But he he, he said random character. I love that. Because what it means is you can't... If, if, it, if I was going into this with Peter the Penguin, one of my little characters... I'd already sort of be think. I'd already know too much about him. By creating a random character, you know nothing. So you are completely making everything up as you go in. And then what he, what he says is, he says, try not to pause slash think. And he says, it doesn't have to be a logical narrative. So for me, this was like, this is a very playful drawing exercise. So what you do is, you, you've got a 10 minute timer, working from top left to bottom right, you, in your head, you, you, you create a, a random character, create a random story, and then you just got to draw the story playing out on the page in 10 minutes. <laughs> so what I did was, the first thing I put was I put the word random character equals, and I thought of a character called Bob the Bear. <laughs> Bob the Bear. So he's just a little bear called Bob. 
And the random story I thought was he's looking for food. So I kept it very simple. So then what I did was I started doing it. The first one, I had this little bear popping its head out of a cave. As if he had just woken up. And then what happens is he, he start, he's he comes out of his cave and he's, he's, he's obviously hungry. <laughs> but in the distance you can see a little apple hanging on a tree. So he, the next phase is he's, he's getting closer to this little tree. Basically all these are really is very rough little thumbnail sketches. The next little panel is he's reaching, trying to get this apple out of the tree. The next one, as he's reaching for it, the apple suddenly vanishes inside the tree. <laughs> so you're thinking, what's happened here? So he starts now climbing into the tree because he wants to get this apple. He pops his head through the tree. Turns out there's a little bird who's taking the apple for himself. And then the bear, he's, he's trying to reach for this for this um, apple. And what happens is the little bird actually gives him the apple. And then the bear, the ne- the final scene is Bob the bear, he's sitting on the floor eating his apple. The little bird is going through the entire tree, dropping all the apples for him. I thought it was cool. So this little bird and the bear are friends now. The bird's sort of helping him get all the apples. So the bear's happy. And I, in my head, what will happen is, you could have another story where this bear, this little um, bird is in trouble or something. And this little bear comes along and helps him. Because that's what happens when, when you help things. When you help people and stuff, they, they help you back. So I thought that was quite cool. I, I, what I loved about this was... I had no idea what was happening. And again, it's almost like the story had a mind of its own. Which I, I've never done anything like this before. And I, I loved it so much. And the good thing is, because you've got this timer, you can't think, like he said. And the other thing is, I didn't think, oh, I've got to create these masterpieces. These these little drawings are very, very rubbish, really, I suppose. But the good thing is, you've got this basic idea here. You could turn this into proper, nice visuals. So for me, this is like a really cool drawing exercise and I'm currently working on the website, (laughs) the website, I'm putting together the recommended section. One of those sections is the recommended drawing exercises. So I'm actually going to add this to it. What did he name it? This is what he said. He said, as part of my character story development process, I've adopted an exercise created by author and illustrator Maurice Sengdak. He called them fantasy sketches. So I called them fantasy sketches. I would imagine what's probably happened is the original artist was doing them for like fantasy. Well, I don't know. I'm going to look into that. But what he, what um, David Melling's done is he's turned it into like, I suppose, little like you're creating little comics, little stories. But I love the fact it's random characters because that means you really go into it completely blind instead of sort of going into it already knowing what you're going to do. So that, I loved that one. That was probably my favourite part of this article was was doing that. The next bit, tip number five, is called a blend of animal and fantasy. So I thought to myself, what's this, what's this all about? I thought, before I even looked into it, what we've got, we've got an image of this like big troll, I suppose. We have a load of little trolls. <laughs> but there's a, the, one of the big trolls is actually holding a little human. So... It, Whereas normally goblins are the little things and we're like the big things. And this one, it's the other way around. Little, It's a little human. It's quite cool. But so I thought to myself, I've put re- relatable but fun. Not boring slash serious like adults. So a blend of animal and fantasy, I thought it was going to be all about basically having it fun for the for the viewer. but And relatable, but also not real. So, if, like here, we've got these little trolls. He talks about how they're actually, they look like humans. So they're relatable, but they're trolls. So they're not humans. So they are fantasy creatures. And he's put, this is what he's, this is me little notes. He's put animals equals, you can get away with things. Get away with things. He, I love this. What I love about this is, the the actual essence of what he's doing here is brilliant. I'm going to read the whole thing, I think, because I love this. He says, I prefer to draw animals and fantasy figures. In children's books, animals can often prove a more convenient currency when tackling sensitive subjects. So basically what he's talking about is, let's say you're talking about something like controversial. If you had humans, the the book would probably get banned. (laughs) Something like that. If you're doing the same story with these little 
like little, well, let's say little cats, what will happen is you can sort of um, subliminally get your get the message across, but it's in a playful way. So I love this. There's a bit of sort of mind manipulation going on here. It's almost like you're sort of brainwashing the children with your beliefs in a in a way that they don't realise it's happening. I thought that was cool. And he says, so he says, animals, you can get away with things. Fantasy too. They're, they're good for sensitive subjects. And I thought to myself, this is quite sneaky, this is. It's quite sneaky. I like it though. And then he's put, he's put, treated goblins like wild animals. And I, well, so what he's done is he's got these little goblins and like they're holding up the human, like how a, an animal would pick up a human and sort of, you know, t- to the animal... Well, not a human. An animal picks up, say... I've seen it, actually, with that cat that used to jump through my window. Once it brought through a little mouse. And I was watching it, throwing this mouse around on the floor. And I was, it was... It basically, I thought to myself, does the, does the cat, is the cat playing with this mouse? Does it know that the mouse is... Does it know what it's doing? So, and it's sort of that thing going on here. It's like the... the what was he talking about? Treated the goblins like wild animals. Yeah, like a human would not pick up a mouse and start throwing it about like that. But a cat a cat can do that. So what he's done is he's got these trolls, which look like humans, but they're still like wild animals. And I thought that's a bit like the reverse of these, the character sketch, the character sheets. He's, the first tip, he was talking about turning the animal into like a baby, but keeping it a... A thing. It's the same. This is sort of a flipped reverse here. He's got these trolls, and he's turning them into animals, but still keeping them sort of like human-like. So it's the same thing as the first thing, but it's in reverse. It's quite weird, isn't it? So you, what you can what you can do is you can turn an animal into a human to make it more relatable. You can also turn a human into an animal to make it more playful. I thought that was cool. And he's also put reality and imagination. Well, that's what I put, because it it reminded me of a lot of the things in the other articles, how even when you're drawing from your imagination, it's still got to be believable. The next little thing we got is, the next tip, number six, is exaggeration. And then in brackets, when sometimes less is more. So what do I think? This is what I thought before I got into it. Exaggeration equals focus point. Focus point, human, focus point... And then I've put human and emotion. So exaggeration, you can get humour and emotion. And I've also put, turn de- you can turn detail into simple shapes, like hair. So, well, where is it? When I draw my little character, little Sophie, I really exaggerate the hair. So, but what that does is it creates these fun shapes. So as I started reading it, I've put the word cool. <laughs> So this was brilliant. What he's got is, in the article, you've got two little images. You've got one image of this cockerel, a really stylized one. And another one, it's exactly the same image, but he's he's turned the opacity down so you can hardly see the the cockerel. And on top of it, he's drawn, in blue ballpoint pen, 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 he's drawn the original, the original turkey. So what you've got is you've got the original drawing of a turkey, which is real. He's then pushed parts of it to make it an actual character. So what he's done is he's like made the beak super long. He's made the the top bit, the hair thing, that he's made that super super long, and he's changed the shape of the eyes and stuff. Subtle, again, it's the word subtle. So you put here, you can see the initial design. So in that final crazy character, which isn't that crazy really. But it is, but it isn't, because it still looks like the first thing, but it just looks a bit different. It's cool. It's, but you can see what he... Yeah, by doing it like this, by seeing the original thing, you can visually see what he chose to exaggerate, which I like that, because sometimes somebody... like It's much easier to understand things when you can see it, I think, than reading about it. More interesting silhouette. That's what I noticed. There's a much more interesting silhouette now because he's he's pushed all the shapes and stuff. And I'll, I put like how this one is set out. Yeah, I like the I like that. I thought it was quite cool. It's almost like he's um reversed he's reverse engineered what he did. 
unexpected happy little accidents. Where was it? There was something at the end he said. Oh, because what he did was, what was it? There was something he talked about, a little happy little accident, which I thought was cool. Unexpected happy little accidents. Here. Oh, I'm going to have to find it. Hey, the, here we go, look. He says, you can see why that I extended the beak, dropped the line of the corner of the mouth. He, what he says is, he says, he narrowed the shape of his eyes, which added an unexpected human tone and exaggerated the wat- the weight of something. But basically what he did was he, he changed the shape of the eye and it made the character more human like, which he didn't, he didn't mean to do that. So happy little accident. He talks about that in a, in a little bit as, as well. I thought that's cool. And then I've put here, little things equals big impact. But it's all about knowing what to add and what to leave out. It's all about knowing what to exaggerate and what not to. Which is practice, I suppose. So the next little piece of this article, I love this one. We've got a little doggy with his two big brown eyes. I love this one. Very simple shape. But it's cool. There's lots of emotion in this. Well, tip number seven is emotion through symmetry. So what did I think before I even got into the thing? What I've put was I put symmetry equals boring, question mark. Because before, in one of these other articles, he was talking about how symmetry was boring. I think it was to draw living, breathing animals. He said about, he drew a, he drew a cat almost symmetrically. And he said this resulted in a stiff and interesting thing. I thought, well, he's just said it's boring. So why is he now using symmetry? And I said, but I find the image pleasing and fascinating. So now, this is where he says, I love this, because I was thinking to myself, I was thinking to myself, he's just said that symmetry is is boring. So why is he now using it? He says, exceptions to the rule. (laughs) And I thought to myself, there are no rules, but there are rules. So like the the rule is, you don't really want to do symmetry, but just because that's a rule doesn't mean you can't, doesn't mean you have to be true to it. So it's experimentation again, I suppose. Well, he's also said that he's talked about this tight cropping. So you've got the you've got the face of this little doggy, but he's tightly cropped it. So you're really pushed to look at the eyeballs. And it says it forces a viewer into the big the big eyes. So he's, what I put here is he said, I said mindful of what this what to yeah he's mindful of what to make symmetrical and what not because he's he talks about where was it. Now that I've already suggested symmetry is best avoided or you risk a figure looking stiff and lifeless, but there are exceptions. Indeed, on occasions, the opposite can be just as powerful. I had this in mind when I drew this whippet. By cropping in tight, I wanted to avoid any distractions, no asymmetrical ears or any an, or any animated eyebrow action. I wanted to, the viewer to have nowhere to go but to those big soulful eyes. It's cool, isn't it? So what he's done is he's he's got it symmetrical, but he's also played it played around with it a bit. The next one, this is brilliant as well. Expressive silhouettes. Number eight, I've put what did I think expressive silhouettes was? I've put this is the words I've put for I've put I thought negative shapes, back and forth, checking so what you're doing is you've got your character, you, you keep turning it into a silhouette to make sure it looks cool, and then you keep putting it back and you I thought that, I thought big bastard basic shapes again, because that's all the silhouette is. Keep it simple and silhouette does yard work. Silhouette does yard work so that the character is pleasing, so you don't have to focus on details and stuff. Almost like the foundation. So as I start going into the little article, this is what I, this is what I put in my notes. Shadow puppetry. <laughs> I thought that was cool. Oh, look at this look. I love this. He talks about Mickey Mouse's ears. He says, Mickey Mouse, where is it? I'm going to read that. It, look, Mickey Mouse's ears sit in 2D on his head so that they can be read clearly in silhouette. How cool is that? So that, that's why Mickey Mouse has got these iconic ears because they're actually 2D. All they are is, this, I've never thought about that before. I thought it was brilliant. And he talks about, he's, um, he used to work in an animation in the studio or something. And that's basically where he got the things about the silhouettes and that so number nine what's it oh yeah i put i love that pose number eight the little it's a little duck holding a suitcase sort of very much in motion but i think it's a really cool pose 
even though you could say it's all a bit stiff, I suppose. Lots of it's not stiff. It's quite cool. <laughs> wow, well, wait a minute, we've gone back. Number nine, colouring Huggless Douglas. This is one of these little characters. This is the bear from before. What have I put in my notes? So colouring Huggless Douglas, what do I think? And I've put process, planning ahead. That's all I could take away from from that. So it's broken into three sections. Section A, capture the pose in pencil. B, wet in wet watercolours. C, embrace happy accidents. So this is my notes that I took from... So for section A, capture the pose in pencil. I've put, he works out the pose, expression, etc. at the pencil stage. And he says it's the most important stage... But what I've put is the most le least detailed and you're least committed. So it's the most playful. So it's like all the fun is at the start. It's experimental. And then the detail is later. So in the pencil phase, it's very much just throw everything out and see what happens. I like that. I feel like that's the best, the best thing. That's why I love sketches so much. Because they're very playful. Section B, I didn't take any notes. I couldn't get any notes from it. But he's basically talking about watercolouring... And now you have to work quickly because it all dries up and stuff. Section C, I've put the word cool. He tells the story of a happy accident. I'm going to read this. Read the little... Ah, oh, this is cool. So the little drawing of Huggless Douglas, you've got this bear, a brown bear, with these little blue, blue speckles on him, which looks really cool. So listen to this. This is what he said. Embracing happy accidents. I finished the details with coloured pencils. The, f the fur flecks were a happy accident. He says, I dropped a bright blue pencil on the surface of an early Douglas pa painting, leaving a chipped blue mark, which I quite liked. It gave me the idea of adding coloured flecks that helped him stand out from the other bears. <laughs> How cool is that? So he just, he, he randomly dropped this pencil part and then he ended up using it in his design. I thought it was cool. It reminds me of Bob Ross, that. Happy little accidents. Number 10, building up anticipation. So what did I think before I even got into this? I said, it's what you don't say, like you're hinting at things. It's what you don't say that's just as important as what you do say. Page Turner, it goes back to that children's book. That, that book, what was that? Um, How to be a children's book illustrator, which I, I'll put a link in the show notes and stuff. In there, they said about one of the things you want is to be to have page turner to make the viewer want to turn the page so what you do is you have the thing in mid mo in the mid action so you what you do you do a drawing of something about to happen it makes them want to turn the page so that's like building up the anticipation so when i started going through the article this is what my notes i said it said his animation days plays into his process and i thought well nothing is ever wasted he might have spent 20 years at that animation thing and then he, he might have left and thought, oh, I wish I had done that because I, I wanted to be doing children's books or something. But now what happens is, as he's going through his life creating his children's books, the things he did in his animation days, which he, he might have thought was like wasted, is actually helping him. So nothing's ever wasted, which I, I like that. He's thinking about how the character moves, what the character behaves like, and then and then... And what's this? The character is real. Oh, yeah. He's thinking about how the character moves, behaves and thinks. So that the character he's creating, it's not just a character. It's actually a real character. In his head, it's a real character with a life of its own and stuff. And then you, in a story, you've got three, three things before, during and after. So what you want to do is if you can capture. Yeah, I'm going to read this bit. This is cool. He says, I anticipate how the character is moving behaving, thinking as I sketch them. What I'm doing is looking to settle on a key moment in that Im imagined sequence during, before, during and after. I often like to add a sequence of three or four images in a row. Yeah, he says it comes from his animation days. <laughs> There's a reason for this. So what he's done is, he's, in this image, we've got an owl. Basically, it's like falling through the sky. So you've got the the first bit, and then you go through the process of him falling through the air. So again, he talks about this as well. He says, it, what it does is, it slows, the, the viewer has to go through the image. 
to see the the owl falling. So what he's doing is he's actually manipulating the viewer's eyes because they have to go through the scene that he's just drawn on one image. So he's in control of the viewer there, which is quite cool. Well, I thought that was brilliant, that bit. And that's it, I think. Also slows down the scene. Yeah, he's got three images in one. The next phase, I love this one. Tip number 11, body language. So what did I think before I got into it? I've, this is what I, I thought. I thought gesture, gesture, gesture. <laughs> Loose and feel it. And I said gesture flows outwards into the structure. So for me, when I think of the word, bo when I think of body language, I, for me, it's all about gesture. That's what I thought. As I go into the article, this is what the, the notes I took. He's put body language equals story. Personal character story. Look at this, look. Body, this is what he said. Body language has so much potential in terms of adding to a character's silent narrative. Using gestures, weight distribution and posture, the results can be obvious and extreme or quiet and subtle. How cool is that? So again, we've got the opposites here. We've got like extreme, obvious or very subtle. But he's, so whereas I thought gesture, 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 he's put gesture, weight distribution and posture. So he's thinking more about structure. I feel like that's probably because I've studied so much on gesture and I haven't studied enough on structure. What's it? What is it? Look, movement without moving. I mean, how cool is that? He's got movement in these... This little, What we've got is we've got these two little goblins. He likes drawing goblins, doesn't he? So we've got these two little goblins in a very static pose, but there is movement in the, the characters. Like One of the things he talks about is... The body language of one of these little goblins, the, the feet are sort of clamped together like a monkey. Like how a monkey puts its feet together. So that sort of, it creates this feeling of, for me it creates a feeling as if the, the, the feet are moving. Even though they're not. So that's cool. He's got movement without, without moving. So that's how powerful body language is. And he's, he's also mindful of the tilting, the pitching and the pulling. Like the tilting angle of the one of the um, goblin's shoulders. That's creating a body language. The weight distribution. And it are, oh, yeah. So by having those feet, like what he's done is he's put feet like, like a monkey puts his feet together. Like when it's holding a banana or something. It, it turns those feet into hands. This is what he said. Turns the feet into hands. Friendly. You're, you're creating the feeling of friendliness there. Ah, oh, this is brilliant as well. So in the image, we've got these two little goblins. In the middle of it is a little flower. He's put here... He's put the flower also as a body language. So what I thought was, it reminded me of Stan Prokopenko again. How everything's got gesture. Gestures in everything. The flower has its own body language. It's amazing, isn't it? Because I never, I never would have thought about that. So number the next one... Well, also, what I put here is body language slash gesture is like a story. So even that flower has got a story. The next one, number 12, is called Silent Narratives. What did I think? So just looking at the images, which we've got a dragon in a little bed. No, in a bath. <laughs> a big dragon squashed in a bath. And you've got these three sort of very strange proportion. This bloke walking. It's the same bloke in three poses. It was all stretched and stuff, a bit gangly like. So what did I think before I got into it? I thought gesture, motion and emotion. That's what I thought. I thought silent narrative is, is all about that. But as we got into it, in I mean little notes, this is what he's talking about. Look, he says cloths, cl clothes and props can also contribute and add value to personality and character. So he's actually talking about it's not just the character, it's the props as well. So again, we've got this connection going on here. We've got the connection of the artist with the character. We've got the connection with the character and the viewer. But we've also got a connection with the character and the props. So there's, there's connection everywhere. There's connection between things inside of the image. And then there's connection between the image and the things outside of the image. Like the humans. 
It's brilliant. So he's put clothes and props equals personality and character. And I've well, this was in their previous article talking about the props. I can't remember who it was. One of them, they, they were talking about the props having like the character and stuff, silhouettes and story. I've also put, yeah, so by adding these clothes and props, we can get humour and like story, which goes into that thing he said about at the start. What was that word he used? Panthos. So you can get panthos. Panthos. It reminds me of Panthro <laughs> from the Thundercats. But you can get that from props and things. A character is related to the background slash props. I thought it was cool. I've put here, I've put, I like this. One level is just a bath. So you've got this bath for, with a dragon in it. So on one level, it's just a bath. So we know that the dragon's having a bath. On the other level, it's part of the character. Where was it? This was brilliant when I read this. He says, look, I enjoyed adding props around this dragon so neatly wedged into his into his bath. An action in itself that tells you something more about him outside the text. So again, you look at that and because the dragon is squishing himself in the bath, you're getting a, you're getting the story of the dragon from that. So it's brilliant, it is. I've put it psychological again. It's all subliminal. You see it without knowing. So you're seeing that and you're thinking, ah, oh, this dragon is obviously... Well, what do I think when I see that? I, th- I think he's sort of... He's, he's like... Um, instead of buying himself at a bath that fits, he's sort of very determined to get himself in that bath. <laughs> so that's what I think. But you don't realise you're thinking that until you sort of read something like this and you realise what's happening. So you're getting the story without knowing how. Yeah, you, you don't realise... What was it we talked about earlier? Something like that. I can't remember. There was something else here where it's like psychological. Yeah, is it? You're 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 getting the story without knowing it until you become aware, which is breaking the illusion. So once you realise how that's happening, you can start doing it yourself. But what happens now is next time you look at an image, you're going to know wh- what's happening here. So you're sort of breaking the illusion of the image. This is quite a spiritual thing here, because it's like the real life. You think real reality is real, till you realise that it's an illusion. At which point, it's it's still real, but it's now it's been broken. You've seen through the illusion, a bit like um, Wizard of Oz. And I I put the word fun circled here, and I said he's having fun. <laughs> yeah, he's having fun here still. So he's having fun in the very first phase when he's creating his character, the character sheets. He's having fun at the start, and even at the end, when he's starting to add in all the details and stuff, he's still having fun with it. It's brilliant. Because I think fun is really important. The next the next little tip, number 13, is called Playful Sketchbook. What we've got is we've got an image of two sheets of his sketchbook full of this sheep. And what would you call it? A crow, I think it is. But it's the same characters all interacting with each other. There's loads of, there's probably about 20 or 30 little sketches here. So what did I think this was before? Playful sketchbooks, I thought, idea generation. I thought it was a bit like the drawing exercise that we did. That's what, that's what sketching is to me. You, you don't really know what you're doing half the time. And it's amazing some of the stuff that comes out when you're sketching. It's brilliant. And I've put here, no fear, no commitment, no rules. I, that's what I love about sketchbooks. That's why I think artists' sketches are the best things to look at. Because when they're doing their sketches, they're, they're fearless. Then they're, they're fearless. When they start doing their proper drawings, they're, they're going to start thinking too much. That's why I love looking at artists' sketchbooks. So I've put here, this is what I got out of the article. This little tip. Never stop exploring. I love that. Always add to the character. So number one, one you sketched it to add to character. Number two, your design, you design that pose, it will bring new ideas. I'm going to have to read this because it goes back into that thing. What was it she said? That thing that thing he said on the Proco podcast. She said, there's a dance between depiction and description. How like form creates function and function creates form. Well, there's a thing going on here with these sketches. Look, I have to read this, I think. 
Once I'm happy with a character, it's important not to stop exploring additional character traits as the drawing continues. Uh, and he talks about his father being a sculptor. And now he, he said, what his father said was he said, the pencil was his thinking stick. <laughs> How cool is that? And he says this happens in his sketchbook. He says, I like to have characters interacting with each other. It's a playful part of character development and one of my favourite parts of the process. So again, you create this character, you create another character, but at the moment they're separate. They're two separate little characters. When you start putting them together, all of a sudden they're going to change each other. So it's brilliant. So you might spend hours creating this character and you think it's going to be a certain type of character. You've got this other character you spent hours on. When you put them together, it might be that all of a sudden this character here is actually... For instance, you might have a character... And you think, like a little, let's say, Dennis the Doggy, you think he's going to be naughty or you're something. You've got another character called Kitty. So for, mo- for the moment, Dennis, little Dennis, he's, he's naughty. But what happens is, when you put a little Kitty in, he might be very protective of Kitty and he's, n- he's no longer naughty. She sort of um, helps him become a bit more sensible. <laughs> so it's almost like, again, we've got this, we've got this connection and relationship between characters. It's amazing. It's amazing, it is. Everything's connected. It's cool. I fear constant entanglement of creation. That's what I thought. There's, as we're drawing and stuff, the whole process of creating, especially characters, is there's this constant entanglement of creation. I love that. Pencil is his thinking stick. I, I think that's brilliant. Characters interacting with each other equals playful. So the next little tip is called background characters. What we've got here is we've got an, a little image with two, four, six, eight, about eight little trees. They're all very similar characters. So you can tell they're all sort of the same tree, but they're also all separate. Again, connection. It's quite weird. But what did I put here? When I said, what do I think this is all about? What do I think background character is all about? Before I even looked at it, I thought they're not too strong a silhouette. So I thought to myself, you don't want the background character's silhouette to be too powerful. Otherwise, it's going to actually overpower the main character. So you, that's quite weird. You've got, you've got to have the background characters be cool, but not be too cool. And then I've put it all similar to blend into one being. So as I looked at the image, I thought, well, we've got we've got these trees. They're all separate. So they're all separate trees. But because they're all so very similar, they almost become like one one being. That's what I thought. And then continuity as well. So all the background characters are the same. We haven't got random characters in the back. Because, again, if they're, all the, if they're all the same, it's going to push them into the background. If you've got all these characters, if you've got all these different characters in the background, it's going to get a bit chaotic and distract you from the main character. So as I started reading the article, what I put in my notes was I said they should add to the main they should add to the main character and they can add to the main character via interaction and conversation. <laughs> it's quite weird. So you can actually have them interacting with visuals, like you might have, say, a cat climbing up one of these trees or something. But you can also have the tree talking to the character in words in the text so the background gar- character can actually interact in two different ways but he's, he's put add to the main character but they shouldn't be the main character so there's this balancing act here and he's put the word group and i've put they are a family they are a family of trees where is it he said the word group uh, yeah look this group found their way into the story i thought that was cool because he, he's it's, for me that was like he's created the group they he sees them as one entity as well that's what i was thinking and i've put book illustration jobs equals add add ah oh, i've got to read this look this is what he says he says i never understood early on that the job of a book illustrator is to add something new to the text to enhance and not just repeat so for me this feels a bit like the background characters the background character's job is to enhance the image that's quite weird that enhance not just repeat but i thought that was brilliant so that's what i'm saying when you're the illustrator of a book 
you you're actually you've you're enhancing you're not just you're actually bringing your own creativity into the image i like that <laughs> what's this here look even a there's even a relationship between the author and the illustrator this is mental so it's never ending connections we've got a connection of the artist with the character we've got a connection of the character with other characters we've got a connection of the character with props in the scene we've got a connection of the character with the viewer we've got a relationship with the character with the background characters we've then got the relationship with the book illustrator with the author it's mental this is what i'm learning i suppose is is, is everything is sort of interconnected and what's it what's this here that's it i think so, and then the last one tip number 15 10 for the price of one what we've got is we've got an image of a bear it looks like mr Huglas douglas again and he's bending over as if he's about to get well that's a bit naughty really but basically he's bending over with his bum in the air and you've got a bunch of sheep as if they've been fired out of a cannon or something fired into his bum it's a bit weird but actually it's cool i never thought it's it's cool it is you got what was it one two three four five six six little sheep and i I was looking at that i thought what is he on about here but he's 10 for the price of one i had no i put what do i think i got no idea and then i put moving moving action question mark cover art question mark so it turns out what he's talking about is what i said in tip number four tip number 14 collection of characters equals one super being so what he's talking about is he's talking about these sheep you've got a bunch of sheep here who are sort of playing with the hugless douglas so they are each individual but they're actually also one collective so that was what i was thinking with these background characters so he says you can have fun here with silent narrative due to the fun silhouette fun poses and the fun scenes of that you can get from these bunch of characters so because you've got a bunch of characters you can create really fun silhouettes so you don't have to have any writing it's again it's a sl- subliminal thing relationships there's a relationships between all of the sheep but there's also a relationship between all of the sheep as a collective and like the main character it's cool oh and he's put here off cam off camera curiosity for the viewer so what you can do is i'm gonna have to read this there's a bit there's a bit here which is cool oh i can't find it now here we go look this enabled me to have more fun with silent narrative whereby they get up to all sorts of things off camera so he's talking about how off the camera they're getting up to stuff and i thought well, that's curiosity for the viewer so the viewer is going to be asking what are these sheep getting up to like off, off the camera what are they getting up to when hugless douglas isn't around almost like that gets the viewer excited thinking what is going on here that's and i thought to myself this is a true character a true character is when the the viewer is asked is wondering what the well i've got to read this look so in my notes i said off camera so that's creating curiosity for the viewer which is creating a it's making the viewer ask questions like i thought to myself you, you start asking what do they do when they're at home what are these sheep getting up to when they're at home and if you if i feel like if you start if you find yourself asking that questions like that about a character if i look at a drawing or an image and i think i want to know more about that character for me that is a really successful character that's a true character because you you've actually connected with them some characters you look at and you sort of you don't really care what they're getting up to because they're just you so when the viewer starts yeah for me that's a sign of a true character when you start asking questions when the viewer starts imagining them because all of a sudden now that character is in in your head that character is in now is now in my head and i'm bringing it to life in my head separate from the from the um, original artist so how amazing is that and i've put our repeated readings that was the last thing i've put i feel like i want to read this article multiple times because there's so much in here and i feel like there's there's just so much to learn from this one so i'm going to go that's basically it that's the 15 little tips i'm going to go right back to the start 
with my main takeaways. So the drawing exercise, that was me, one of my main takeaways. We had this little drawing exercise. And what happened was, for me, that was actually the highlight of the article. Because that's, that's brilliant, that is. Playful. The whole thing was playful. The images were playful. The artist is definitely playful. And uh, the sort of way he works is playful as well. Keywords. I feel like that's a key. I feel like keywords are the key. Because what you can do is, you can get a lot of information into one little word. So all you've got to do is remember, for instance... Let's think of a word. Well, let's think of a word here. Scared. Think of the word scared. You, there's a lot of stuff in that. So all you all you got to do is remember the one keyword, scared. You can, and it goes into something Bert Dodgson said about in his book, Keys to Drawing. He said, he called them trigger words. As you're drawing something, let's say you're drawing a little dog, like little Dennis, with fur. If you remind yourself that it's fur and fluffy, and I also feel like if you touch, if you're touching the fluffiness of that fur as you're drawing, that fluffiness comes out in your drawing. It's the same with the word. If you keep saying to yourself, fluffy, 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 the pencil will start drawing fluffy. So I feel like if you keep repeating these keywords as you're drawing, as you're drawing a little pose of a little doggy, if you're thinking to yourself, well, he, what was he said? He said toddler. So he's thinking of the word toddler. That's going to actually turn the dog into more of a toddler. Keywords. That was all through the articles where he kept bringing up the keywords. Open-minded as well. You've got to be open-minded. That's something I've noticed a lot. You've got to be open-minded for being an artist. Silhouettes. Again, this is something I've... It's really getting rammed down my head in all these articles is is the thing about silhouettes, the power of them. Subtle, that's another thing as well. Less is more. It goes into that thing about the big bastard basic shapes. If you can get lots of detail and to squish it into into simple, you can get a lot of it. It's almost like that is a visual way of looking at keywords. Keywords is one word, but it's got a lot of information in it. It's the same with like some shapes. You can have a shape which is very simple... But it's got a lot of information in it. Exaggeration as well. I feel like exaggeration is linked to playfulness. That's what I think. Well, actually, I'd say exaggeration is linked to emotion. Because you can have something very scary. And if you over-exaggerate it, it can create a real sense of scariness. So I feel like, actually, exaggeration is linked with emotion. Which goes into that thing you said about with panthos. Which is like creating an emotion. So that's, that's one way of getting this, what's it called, the Panthos thing, happy accidents. I love that because something with me is I want to be in control of things a lot. I'm really noticing that a lot in my life lately is I've got, I've got to sort of let go of a lot of control things. That's again, it's something you learn in art, especially when I was doing that abstract painting, is you have to let go of control. And that's when all the, that's when the fun stuff happens because if you're super in control you're going to be really tight whereas if you're if you're just accept if you allow yourself happy accidents and let it be you're going to be so loose and carefree that it'll be even more exciting it's cool lots of anima anthropomorphic i love that i feel like that's key to remember is you want to turn your animals into humans but still keep them as animals and also turn humans into animals but still keep them humans. I feel like that's I feel like that's a key f to remember that because that, that's what's creating a connection with, with the viewer. Because the viewer, the viewer looking at the drawing isn't a dog. But if the dog looks like a bit like a if it's a if it's a little child looking at this book and they're looking at a dog and the dog looks a little bit like a child they're going to connect with that dog a lot more than if it's just a dog. But if it's too much like a child, f for me, it wouldn't be as cool, as cute and stuff. So balancing. And again, if you can turn a human into an animal, it's going to create more of a, more of a, for me, it'd be a connection with like the playfulness. Because we all like animals. So gesture. Oh, nothing is ever wasted as well. I love that. Nothing's ever wasted. No matter what you're doing gesture i feel like gesture is actually 
a key ingredients here. Oh, what was it? I thought of something this morning. I thought of something because I thought to myself, yeah, this is it. So what I thought was, for me, like gesture is key. But what you start to realise is it goes into that thing that the, what who was it? Kirsten said about dance between depiction and description, form creating function and function creating form. I thought it's the same sort of thing. When you draw, when you're creating a drawing, you've got like you when you're st- when I'm, when you're studying, you're trying to get good at drawing. You sort of look at it and you think, well, I've got to get good at gesture drawing. I've got to get good at structure. I've got to get good at actual like color theory. I've got to get good at actual rendering and stuff. And you think you got to do each one. So you think, but w- what I started realizing was it's not like that. You actually, it's all of them. It's you've got to learn all of them, but it's. Because basically, you, you learn your gesture, but if you can't render, what's the point in your gesture? But if you learn your rendering, but you can't gesture, what's the point in your rendering? So it's like everything sort of... It's all like sort of... Basically, it's like you can't just sit and study gesture and do nothing but gesture, because it, you've got to get the other bits. But so, so there's this thing, this is where it gets a bit overwhelming sometimes... To, you thought you think to myself, how am I supposed to do all of this? And the thing is, when I love doing gesture and I don't, I don't enjoy as much the other bits, like structure and that. That's when you got. That's when you. That's when you'll really find out. I think, and that's the bit I'm at. I'm really going to find out how much I want this because I've got to do things I don't really enjoy as much as the other bits. At least I think I don't. But I feel like I haven't done the structure stuff enough to know whether I enjoy it. And again, like. When you're reading this sort of thing here, you can see you can make all parts of the drawing process fun. Because for me, I feel like the thing with me is structure. I feel like it's too controlled, but it isn't. So if I can, if I can get myself into adding more structure with this carefree attitude of happy accidents, that might actually allow me to sort of have more fun with with the structure. Because that's why I love gesture so much. With gesture, you can't. Do it wrong. You're just you're just capturing the essence. What was the other thing I put? Relationships. Yeah, like the relationship between the author and the illustrator. I feel like that is the key takeaway from this. The key takeaway from this article for me was was the relationship, and it's the connection and relationship between everything. Creating characters for me, character design is all about relationship and connection. Yay! <laughs> Little Dennis has said it's time it up. I hope you enjoyed that. I, I had so much fun with that. And this article, I've learned so much. As I've said in my little notes, I said so much wisdom, but so simple. So I really hope you enjoyed that. I'll put links and everything in the description so you can find the artist, David Melling, because he is pretty cool, I think. <laughs> so that's it for this one. What are we going to have next week? No idea. Which is quite cool, isn't it? When you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, actually, we've got this week's little inspirational quote. That's all that's left. We'll have a little extra kitty kiss as well. Because they like they like kissing. And, uh, well, actually... Yeah, making up for the old... The last few... Look at... Well, kitty's titties. Kitty's titties. She's got big titties. But this week's little inspirational quote... Doing. Well, this one. I love this one. This is from the artist David Melling, who did the article, and it is, everything you draw has character potential. What I love about this is, everything you draw has character potential. It reminds me of something that Stan Prokopenko said in one of his videos. when it, I was learning gesture drawing, capturing the essence of something, and he said, a gesture, is ev- gesture is in everything, even a rock, even a static rock that's just sitting there, not doing anything. It's still got a gesture, still got a life to it. So that's the thing. Why? Why? The main thing I got from this article really was how, no matter what you're drawing, you're getting character, and characters create stories. So the whole thing is about story. You could have. A, I feel like you could have a scene, a drawing without any characters in it. There would still be story in it. <laughs> how cool is that? So this week's little inspirational quote: Everything you draw has character potential. David Melling.